Now this chapter, chapter 21, deals pretty much exclusively with the, the, king, the kingship of Manasseh. Wicked Manasseh. And we just got done reading three chapters, three weeks in a row on Hezekiah. Hezekiah was a great man of God. And I, I'm going to bring this up again. I brought it up last week. But we saw in chapter 18 how great of a man Hezekiah was in the, in the eyes of the nation as well as in the eyes of God. He really was a good man. Now, he had his flaws, and we went over that last week. We kind of saw a lot of the, the, the lack of character in certain in specific areas and faults that Hezekiah had in his life. But he was a great man of God. And in chapter 18, I just want to reread this. We remember in verse number 4, it tells us a little about some of the things that he did. Chapter 18, verse 4 says, he removed the high places. Now, remember, we've been going through this whole book week after week. We started in 1 Kings, and we've been going week after week after week. And what do we see over and over again? The high, you know, even with good kings, they did good. They did right in the sight of the Lord, but the high places were not removed. People still worship there. And, I mean, it's like week after week after week after week. The high places are still there. The high places, you know, they still haven't gotten things right. Never right. Then we finally get to Hezekiah. And Hezekiah, it says, he removed the high places and break down the images and cut down the groves and break in pieces the brazen serpent that Moses had made. For under those days, the children of Israel did burn incense to it. And he called it Nehushtan. Verse 5, he trusted in the Lord God of Israel so that after him was none like him among all the kings of Judah, nor any that were before him. Undoubtedly, a great man of God did a lot of great works had a lot of great um, successes and victories. You know, when the king of Assyria came down and, and the captain of the host of, of the, the Assyrians came and they, they blasphemed the Lord and they're like, who is the Lord? You know, what happened to the gods of all the other land, you know, of the other lands that we've conquered? Where are they? And you're going to trust in the Lord. And they mocked and ridiculed. But Hezekiah had faith. He had faith in God, no matter, no matter what the odds were, and God protected him and God saved him. Lots of great victories. But what, what I covered a little bit last week, kind of near the end of the sermon, was his one big failure and not having the foresight and not investing in the future. He did a lot, a lot, and I don't want to understate what he did because he's a great king and, and, he's, and he's recognized as such. But the one big failure was a really big failure. And his lack of... Of, of training his child cost not just him and his family, but all of Israel tremendously, all of Judah, which is what he was king over at that time. We see going from one extreme to the other, from Hezekiah to Manasseh, and just the extreme difference that we see, almost polar opposites when it comes to the works that were being done. I mean, he just gets done removing the high places, doing all this stuff. And he's raining, everything's going great. And we saw, though, when he, when he got his uh, disease and God healed him, he entreated the Lord. What happened? He ended up getting lifted up with pride. He allowed the Babylonians in to see all the great wealth that King Hezekiah had. And he was lifted up with pride. And then when God said, hey, you're going to be judged for this, when he, got, when he received the message, and he says, well, it's not going to come in your days, but it's going to come in the days of your sons. He says, well, good then. As long, as long as no evil comes in my days, then great. And he lived too much for the moment and didn't think about the future. And because of his lack of foresight and lack of investing time, you know, while he's out doing all these great works, what happened to his son? What happened to his children? What happened to Manasseh? He went to the devil and ended up destroying all of the great works that he had done. I mean, think about, just think about doing right and doing good and doing great works. It is way more effort and energy and time to actually build up and, and to help to change a culture and to get people to follow the Lord. That is a lot of work. The easy way is just to forsake it all, get into sin, live, live a you know, wicked lifestyle. That's the easy way. The hard way is putting in the effort and just really getting rid of all the wickedness and getting people on board. And he had the people on board. He had the people of Judah on board with him. They all loved him. He was greatly honored when he died. And, and we, we had already read that, how he, you know, he was respected. And, and even when the, when the Assyrians came to battle and they were, they were talking to the, to the men on the wall, 
you know, when they would have wanted to respond to him, they didn't. Why? Because Hezekiah said so. Hezekiah said, hold your peace. And they all listened to him. They had respect for him. It was evidence throughout many stories. But where it matters the most, in his own house, with his own children, he didn't do a good job. And everything that he had worked for and spent his time on in his life ended up getting torn down. Now I know physical things, we know they're all going to get burned up anyways. You know, the physical works that we do. But what a tragedy to, to lose your own son and what I believe is because he got himself too involved in doing everything else and not spending the appropriate time with his son at home, with his child. Look, we, there's, God wants us to do great works and God could use us to do great works and God wants us to be able to do things, but we need to understand the importance of our children because they are very important. And we need to have the foresight to understand that, especially, you know, we, I, I know about this. I want to be able to raise children to do more things than I can do. I want it to continue. I want whatever I do to be great and I want God to use me greatly. It's not about me. I just want the work to be done. But I also want to see my children succeed and do even greater and do even more and give them the best head start that they could have and then their children the same way do even more and just continue on building up and building up and building up. And that, that understanding and that foresight of having your children, training up your child in the way he should, way he should go so when they're older he will not depart from it. Hey, the Bible says that and I believe it. And I believe Hezekiah's son, I mean, he had every opportunity and he had the whole nation behind him. But he didn't invest the time when it was needed and where it was needed. His son, and think about this too, I mean, he got, he got so screwed up. He was only 12 years old when he began to reign. 12 years old. Look at verse number one here in chapter 21. Let's, let's get into the chapter. We're going to see and reread some of the things that, that, that he ended up doing. And it's ultimately for this cause, for Manasseh, that God's judgment is coming and God does not turn back from that judgment. Things were going great with Hezekiah. The, the, the kingdom of Judah could have maintained and could have, you know, they were serving the Lord. God was their God. It didn't have to come to this to where they had to, to be taken away captive until Manasseh. So for all the great works Hezekiah did, Manasseh just flushed it all down the toilet. Look at verse number one. The Bible says, Manasseh was 12 years old when he began to reign and reigned 50 and five years in Jerusalem. And his mother's name was Hephzibah. This is a long reign, 55 years, a long time to lead a country. I mean, you started at 12 years old, you got, you got those years, right? Verse number two, and he did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord after the abominations of the heathen whom the Lord cast out before the children of Israel. For he built up again the high places which Hezekiah's father had destroyed. So one generation is all it lasted. Hezekiah tore everything down. Finally, the high places are gone. Manasseh rears it back up again. And you know, had he spent the time teaching and training his child Manasseh, he could have taught him, you know, that you need to serve the Lord, that you need to get saved, you need to trust in God and not in these high places and look at, you know, and really invest the time teaching why it was so important. Instead of just, oh, I don't know why dad did that. The people liked it. It's a long tradition. We've had those things forever. I'm going to bring them back. That's what Manasseh does. And so right back to having the high places built. Uh, and then it says, and he reared up altars for Baal and made a grove as did, king, as did Ahab, king of Israel, and worshipped all the hosts of heaven and served them. Now, remember when we were reading about Ahab, Ahab was the most wicked king up until that point. So he was even worse than Jeroboam, the son of Nebat. He had done more wickedly than all the kings that were before him. And God's judgment on Ahab was to, to take out his whole family, take out his whole line, right? It's a, that his whole household was going to end up coming to nothing. And, and, and his lineage was going to be destroyed from, from, before, from off the face of the earth. And that's what happened. So we have Manasseh going right back to those ways of wicked Ahab, serving Baal, which is Satan. Verse number four says, And he built altars in the house of the Lord, of which the Lord said in Jerusalem, Will I put my name? 
Now we're going to see a, a few more statements like this where there's a contrast between what Manasseh did and what the Lord said. He said, look, Jerusalem is where my name is going to be. Everyone's going to know that the Lord reigns in Jerusalem. And what does Manasseh do? Rears up Baal in God's own house. I mean, you talk about how wicked is that? You go into the temple of the Lord. You go into the house of God and just start rearing up false gods. And, and you know, I've mentioned this quite a few times. But idolatry and having other gods before God is, is, is one of the things that God hates the most. If you really want to tick God off, go off and start worshiping other, other gods. Because without fail, that is the reason why the children of Israel and Judah get taken away captive. It all boils down to them just completely forsaking the Lord and going after other gods. Hey, our God is a jealous God, and he's a consuming fire, and he's not going to take it. when you. I mean, think about this, how, how enraged... A man might get when his wife just goes and plays the whore and goes sleeping with a bunch of other guys, how angry that would make you. That's the way that God uh, relates us worshiping him with worshiping some false idols that we're whoring around and going after these other strange gods and false gods and things like that. It makes God really, really angry. That gives you a little bit of an understanding of how, of how serious it is with God to just go and then and then to bring that home. It would be like, you know, coming home on your spouse in your own bed. Right? Not even just going off somewhere else, but just in your house, in your holy place, in your sanctuary. This is happening. This is what Manasseh did. This is just to help you understand how serious because you can look at somebody like, oh, well, it's just some false God. It's not that big of a deal. No, it is a big deal. It is a very big deal. He brought that into God's house. And, and brought, set up these altars where God said, no, my name is going to be there. Verse number five, and he built altars for all the hosts of heaven in the two courts of the house of the Lord. So he built, he's built more altars. Verse number six, and he made his son pass through the fire and observe times and used enchantments and dealt with familiar spirits and wizards. He wrought much wickedness in the sight of the Lord to provoke him to anger. So not only was he doing all of that stuff with the false gods, he was even doing child sacrifice, his own child, his own son, to pass through the fire. And he got into all this witchcraft and the psychics and the, and the wizards and all this, this magic and, and occult stuff. Making God angry. And, we, and you know, if, you read, if you're familiar with the law of the Old Testament, the Bible says, Thou shalt not suffer a witch to live. That this was a death penalty for people who you know, consulted with familiar spirits, who were, who were communicating with, the, you know, with these, these demons and these, these spirits. That all carried the weight of the death penalty, as did murder, right? I mean, causing your own son to pass through the fire is pretty bad. Um, Verse number seven, it says, And he set a graven image of the grove that he had made in the house, of which the Lord said to David and to Solomon his son, In this house and in Jerusalem, which I have chosen out of all tribes of Israel, will I put my name forever. Neither will I make the feet of Israel move any more out of the land which I gave their fathers, only if they will observe to do according to all that I have commanded them and according to all the law that my servant Moses commanded them. But they hearken not. Look at this. And Manasseh seduced them to do more evil than did the nations whom the Lord destroyed before the children of Israel. That is a very strong statement in and of itself, saying that they did more evil than the nations whom God destroyed. Now, the reason why those nations that God destroyed was because of their wickedness. And when you read Leviticus, and when you read Deuteronomy, and when you read Exodus, and you read the parts of God's law, and you get to the points, like in Leviticus 18 and 20, and, not, you, know, and, and, and you see these, these laws that God made, you know, especially when it gets to the point of like lying down with a beast and man, man lying with man and women lying with you, know, and, 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 and how sick and perverted and twisted it's like, God, do you really even have to tell it? You know, wouldn't, wouldn't you think that at least that should be common sense among us? No, and the reason why those had to be given, he said, because the people that were in the land did all these things. And you read through all of that stuff, all of that sin. The people of the land that were in the land of Canaan, the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Amorites and the Hivites and the Jebusites, they all, they were doing those things. They were guilty of all of those things. 
And because of that, God had, had to bring judgment upon that land. And the land had to spew them out of their mouth because they had just got, they had devolved and gotten so far degraded that God just said, you know what? Judgment's coming. It's just, you've just made it go too far. And for as bad as that was, he says that Manasseh seduced the people to do even worse. Even worse. Now it says here that he seduced the people. I think about this. And this kind of boggles my mind a little bit how, but it also shows you how easily people can be swayed. Hezekiah was a man loved of the nation and a man that served the Lord and got everyone right. I mean, the people could have hated him for tearing down all the altars and the high places and the things that had been there for hundreds and hundreds of years. Their heritage, right? People could look at those holy places of the high places because they're ignorant of, the, of God's word and gotten upset that he took all that stuff away, but they still loved him. They still supported him. They still honored him. And then Manasseh comes along and does the exact opposite, but they still support Manasseh. And you see later when... Uh, when, his, when he dies and then his son reigns for two years and then people conspire against him and kill him, the people are still upset. Hey, man, you killed, you know, the king's son. And they, and they were still had the dedication to that household. Even though Manasseh had wrought so much wickedness and Ammon, his son, didn't do much better either. We see the dedication of the people to these, to these kings, even though they were doing almost the opposite things. And the reason he was able to do that, is he seduced them. Now, we want to see, and I think this, this shows us also a little bit of wisdom at how much damage an insider can do. Because Manasseh was born into this family. And most pe people have a tendency to think that, oh, you're Hezekiah's son. And they're automatically just going to, boom, place you up on that pedestal because Hezekiah was such a great man. Not even realizing Hezekiah didn't do anything to raise his son. Yeah, he was a great man but it doesn't mean his son's going to be. And we need to be careful about that too. You may know someone and say, hey, this is a great person, this is a great Christian, they're sold out, they live for God. But you can't just, just impart everything that, that is about that person on their family members. I mean, that doesn't matter. I mean, it's, it's, it's funny because we talk to people about soul winning sometimes where they're like, oh yeah, my brother's a pastor, or my uncle, my, my grandfather, you know, it's like, well, that doesn't mean anything for you because you don't even know how to go to heaven. You know, I mean, it's, you, don't, you don't even have any knowledge, but they want to rely on the fact that someone else, you know, they're this great person. They do all this great stuff. That doesn't matter. It's about you. But we see Manasseh, he's kind of an insider. His father was extremely respected and revered. And you know that's how he got his foot in the door with the people because they were automatically going to put their confidence in him. They, they, they already trusted him. They trusted Hezekiah. They're going to trust his son. And because of this, he was able to do, I believe, the most damage. Had he been an outsider coming in and trying to make all these changes, the people probably would have been much more suspicious. But coming from the inside, coming as, as Hezekiah's son, right? So I imagine, and I, you know, again, I'm speculating a little bit on this. When he started to introduce things and introduce the high places and introduce these things, I don't think it happened like a switch overnight. He reigned for 55 years. We have one chapter condensing his reign into, into, you know, however many words is in here. It's not very many. I'm sure he, was, he would give reasons why he's going to build up these high places and stuff and transitioned to the full-blown Baal worship and just setting up these altars. And, you know, all oh, these, he was these, he's a new, a neo or a new, you know, Lord worshiper or whatever, doing, bringing in all this stuff. Oh, I've got all these great ideas to serve the Lord and we're going to bring in this altar and this altar. We're just going to change things up and we're going to get hip with the times, right? And it was just total wickedness. But this is how, this is how people kind of grab on and watch out for that too. You know, we need to stick to the old ways, the old path, where it is the good way. And, and God has it laid out for us. God doesn't want us to stray from his path. We listen to him, we trust in him, we do things his way, and we'll be good. That's all he wants out of us. He doesn't need us to go off and come up with all these different ways to do things. It's just, you know what? Just do the things that I tell you to do. And, and God's happy with that. To, um, to obey is better than sacrifice. But no matter how much you could give and you're willing to give all this stuff, he's saying, you know what? Just obey me. Do that. People have a hard enough time with that. Let's, let's see if we can, we can handle doing that. But Manasseh did so much wickedness. We see, let's keep reading here, verse number 10. 
And the Lord spake by his servants, the prophets, saying, Because Manasseh king of Judah hath done these abominations, and hath done wickedly above all that the Amorites did, which were before him, and hath made Judah also to sin with his idols, therefore thus saith the Lord God of Israel, Behold, I am bringing such evil upon Jerusalem and Judah, that whosoever heareth of it, both his ears shall tingle. It shows you how, how serious God is. He's saying, you know what? Because of Manasseh, because of his evil, and because of him seducing the people and everything they did, what I have planned in store for the judgment, he says, people that just hear it, it's going to hurt their ears. They're going to be like, oh, man. You know, their ears are going to tingle. It's going to be like, wow, that's horrible. That actually happened? Yes. Because the Lord is a righteous God and he's a righteous judge and, and he, he, he's long-suffering and merciful. And you know, I love focusing on that. I love, I love telling people, especially people who are not saved, how merciful God is and how God has a free gift for you and an eternal life and stuff. But you know what? We cannot forget the fact that God does have his limits and that you can push things too far with God and that there, there is a time where God will bring judgment and bring punishment even in this lifetime. Not, not even considering hell or eternal damnation, but in this lifetime, he says, you know what? That's it. I've had enough. And Manasseh pushed that limit with God. Verse number 13, And I will stretch over Jerusalem the line of Samaria and the plummet of the house of Ahab, and I will wipe Jerusalem as a man wipeth a dish, wiping it and turning it upside down, just completely turning them, upending them, um, Verse number 14, And I will forsake the remnant of mine inheritance and deliver them into the hand of their enemies. And they shall become a prey and a spoil to all their enemies because they have done that which was evil in my sight and have provoked me to anger since the day their fathers came forth out of Egypt even unto this day. Look at verse number 16. Moreover, Manasseh shed innocent blood very much till he had filled Jerusalem from one end to another beside his sin wherewith he made Judah to sin in doing that which was evil in the sight of the Lord. Now, this is a big deal and it gets a second mention about him filling the land with innocent blood. We see who God is when we read all of his word. We understand the goodness and the mercy as well as the fiery judgment. And we need to understand where we are at today. Don't get too much nationalistic pride in the great country of the United States of America, God's country, a Christian nation, and get so lifted up and you get blinded to the wickedness and the sin that's around us day after day after day and you forget about the things and, and the blood that's being shed, the innocent blood that is, that is being shed in our land on a daily basis. It's easy not to remember those things when, when you are living a righteous life and trying to stay away from that stuff. But I'll tell you what, you just look at the number of abortions that are being done in this country day after day after day, year after year after year, and that is innocent blood literally being shed in this country on a daily basis, and it is wicked out of the pit of hell. I mean, this is the type of thing that I think of when I see, when it says, Manasseh shed innocent blood very much. We already saw that he's willing to sacrifice his own son through the fire unto Molech or, or Baal. You know, he's a Baal worshiper. And we have people now that have their own false gods, their own satanic gods, the god of money the God of this world, the God of, of whatever it is, their, their easy life, their hassle-free life because they don't want to have children. Because it's too difficult. Oh, I wasn't planning on having this, so let's just kill it. Talk about a wicked, wicked imagination, a wicked thought. And it's a wicked people that accepts that and says, yes, that's okay. And don't be deceived by these, pol these wicked politicians just because they have an R next to their name you think they're really going to do anything about this? They don't care. They're all greedy. They don't, they don't fear the Lord. If they feared the Lord, someone would actually do something about this. Go sit down, sweetie. Go sit down. Go by mama. <laughs> if, they, if they feared God, if they feared God, they, they would do something. But nothing's being done. Now look, right now in our government, isn't it Republican-controlled? 
the, the Congress as well as the presidency, don't they have enough votes if they really want to do something to change things? But it's not going to happen. It never does. This isn't the first time it's been like that in, in very long at all. And we just had this eight years ago, ten years ago, right? I mean, this is, this is a cycle that continues and nothing is ever done about it. You cannot trust politicians to get the job done at all. You know, there's, there's people who want to get in and start making rules for everybody. I, I worry about what their motivation is to begin with anyways. I don't want to rule your life. We've got enough rules. Let's just follow God's rules and we'll be good. But it, it's, it's disgusting. It's sickening. And I'll tell you what, God hasn't changed. What he, he sees, he hears the voices of those unborn children that are mutilated. And look, I don't want to try to get too graphic today, but we have to understand what's really happening because the, the lie is out there that's going to tell you that it's not really a child that's developing inside. Of, it, it's just these cells. Like, they're, they're just trying to make it sound like, like you, you have a wound on your, in your skin or something. And it's, oh, there's just these cells working and it's almost like a bacteria or something that's kind of growing. No, no. No, it's a human life. And you can see from very, very, very early life, and thank God for the, you know, the imaging technology and stuff to be able to see this stuff, that they can't just perpetuate this lie. Oh, just some clump of cells, a blastocyst or whatever, whatever they want to put a name on it to dehumanize the child that is alive and growing inside of the womb to make people think it's okay to just murder, extinguish that life. And every, I don't care what your reason is, it's selfish. Any reason that anyone has to kill a child is selfish. Oh, well, what type of life would have you? You know, we're, it's, it's interesting because people these days now, they want to kill a child because if they could find out that they're going to have some defect, right? Maybe someone born with Down syndrome. We have someone in the room tonight that we just found out, you know, has a granddaughter that was born with Down syndrome. You know what? Everyone loves her. And I know that he loves her and, and wouldn't want it any other way but to have that granddaughter there. But some people are going to want to choose to just murder that child because they think, oh, this child can't be loved or they're not going to make it in this world. Well, you know what? We've got living proof to say the otherwise. We are going to my previous church. There was a girl that was going there for a long time, had, had Down syndrome again, but was able to, she loved God. She was able to give the gospel to people. And you know what? A lot of people listened to her. Because they wanted to, because she was trying hard and, and they didn't want to be rude to her and they were going to listen. You know what? She was able to reach people for Christ because of that, because of that disability. Everybody is special in God's eyes and no one is made to be murdered. Not one person. And that is innocent blood. You don't get more innocent than a child in a womb. A defenseless child that has to be inside of a body so that because there's so many other things that can go wrong and that could cause a life to perish. God has given them the protection of their mother's own womb to go inside of there with scissors and forceps or saline or whatever and just melt or burn or, or destroy that child. That is, that is wicked. And I, you know, these doctors are, are, they've got to be the most reprobate people on this earth because they know what they're doing. They may be able to lie to the mom that comes in or to the lady that comes in and try to convince them that it's just a group of cells or something, but they know. They know what they're doing with those instruments that they're putting up inside of there. They can't hide that from God. And God hears and God knows what's happening. And Manasseh shed innocent blood very much. And I'll tell you what, we're going to get to this in a minute. We don't see this in 2 Kings 21. We're going to turn to 2 Chronicles 33 when we're done with this chapter, if you want to put a bookmark there, because we're going to get another side of this story of Manasseh. Manasseh ends up repenting. Manasseh gets right with God, but he has done a lot of wickedness in his life. A lot of wickedness. And because of that, even though he repents, God still just says, you know, the judgment's coming. It's too much. Do I want the United States to repent? I do. I want people to turn to God. I pray that that happens. I would love for people to just turn with their whole heart unto God and to serve him like never before. But I believe that we've already crossed the line with God. When we see just in, in 55 years, that was Manasseh's time, right? How long has it been since Roe v. Wade? 70... Five, 77? I don't know. Somewhere, somewhere in that time. I don't know the exact year. In the 70s, right? 
30, 40, we're going on 50 years? Innocent blood is being shed abundantly in this, in this land. Manasseh made it legal. He shed the blood innocently. It's been made legal. You know, we're, we're, we need to be prepared. Now look, God is capable of keeping his people right through, through anything. He was able to, you know, to keep Elijah through the famine. He was able to, you know, he, he's able to keep and sustain his people. But we need to be aware of this. Because God is a, is, is a judging God, and we need to have a proper fear of the Lord, and all the more reason to go out and warn people. God is real. Whether you want to believe that or not, God is real. And shedding this innocent blood is something that he doesn't stand for. He's long-suffering and merciful. He gives people opportunities. He gives people chances. Yes. But we need, you know, th this nation needs a healthy dose of a fear of the Lord. And you know what? And if people don't want to get that healthy dose through preaching, God will bring it through other means. And he'll make sure. Because he'll, oh, in the end, he always gets glorified. The Bible says, you know, in the end, every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory, to the glory of God the Father. That's going to happen. He's going to make sure that happens. For some people, it may be spending some time in hell before they're resurrected, before that great white throne judgment. They're going to be bowing their knee. I guarantee you they're not going to be proud at that point. Spending any amount of time in hell. It's going to bring everybody, anybody low. Before anyone can get right with God, we need, to be, we, need, we need to humble ourselves. And it's better to humble yourself before God has to bring you low. Lower yourself first. Let's keep reading here a little bit about what he did here. Verse 17 says, Now the, the rest of the acts of Manasseh and all that he did and his sin that he sinned, are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the kings of Judah? And Manasseh slept with his fathers and was buried in the garden of his own house in the garden of Uzzah, and Ammon his son reigned in his stead. Now this is, kind of, this is a little bit interesting too, that he wasn't buried with, um, in the same place that like the other kings have been buried. You know, a lot of them would, would, would be buried in, in similar places. He was buried in his own house and in this garden, the garden of Uzzah. Remember Uzzah, the story of Uzzah. And I, I don't know for a fact that this is the same person, but I, I think it probably is the reason why this is in here. Uzzah was the one when they were bringing the, the Ark of the Covenant back to Israel. And they had it on a cart instead of carrying it like they were supposed to be carrying it with staves, the way that God said it. Again, the way that God said to do things, carry it on staves. They'd be a lot careful that way, but they weren't supposed to touch it. They weren't supposed to be handling it. They were supposed to be moving it around using the staves that God had ordained for them to do. They put it on the cart because that's what the heathen did. They put it on a cart. Like, hey, this is pretty cool. It's easy. We'll put it on wheels. Yeah, we'll drive it. We'll get there. They hit a bump. It's about to fall off. Us is like, whoa, well, we can't have the ark fall on the ground. I mean, we want to to desecrate it, right? So he put out his hand to save it and he died right there. He, there's a breach upon the Lord by him doing that. He wasn't supposed to do that. Now, you could say, yeah, but he didn't want it to fall on the ground. Yeah, but they shouldn't have had it on the cart. Yeah, it shouldn't have fallen to the ground and he shouldn't have touched it. They put themselves in that situation by not listening to God to begin with. And that was Uzzah in the, where he was buried. It's kind of interesting how, you know, the, the, the man that, that didn't hearken to God, that's where this other man that didn't hearken unto God was buried. But let's keep reading here. Verse number 19. Ammon was 20 and two years old when he began to reign, and he reigned two years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Meshulamith, the daughter of Herez of Jotba. And he did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord, as his father Manasseh did. And he walked in all the way that his father walked in and served the idols that his father served and worshipped them. And he forsook the Lord God of his fathers and walked not in the way of the Lord. And the servants of Ammon conspired against him and slew the king in his own house. And the people of the land slew all them that had conspired against King Ammon. This is what I was referring to earlier. The people of the land, they still had regard to, the, you know, to that household. And, and they, they killed the conspirators. And, uh, and the people of the land made Josiah his son king in his stead. Now the rest of the acts of Ammon which he did, are they not written in the book of the chronicles of the kings of Judah? And he was buried in a sepulcher in the garden of Uzzah, and Josiah his son reigned in his stead. And I can't wait till next week to preach on Josiah. It's like one of my favorite people in the whole Bible. But turn, if you would, now to 2 Chronicles 33. Because that whole chapter 21, that's all we hear about in the, book of the, the books of the kings about Manasseh. And it was all negative, no doubt about it. It was wicked, and, and there's a point being made that he did evil, he did all this stuff, and ultimately he's responsible for the children of Judah being taken captive. 
by Babylon. And, and it, it's because of his reign and his seducing of the people do evil. But we see another side, and this, this, this gives you, can give us hope. You know, we hear in the New Testament that the, the Apostle Paul said, you know, that, that he was chief of sinners. He said, among whom I am chief. Right? God's able to save sinners among whom I'm chief. And he, and he was, you know, he's able to, he was someone who attacked the church of God. He's someone who went out and persecuted the church of God and actually was willing to kill and to bring it that far. And, and I mean, he was pursuing, he was going into city. He didn't even, he didn't even want to sit in his hometown enough and that wasn't good enough for him. He's like, you know what? We're going to drive these people out and we're going to go after them. And he was almost rabid in his, in his zeal to just, to get rid of these Christians. So he did a lot of wicked things, but you know what? He was able to get saved. And we're going to see Manasseh. I believe Manasseh got saved, even though he did all this stuff. And it's important to remember this because it's easy to write people off. Now, I do believe that Romans 1 teaches that there are some people who become reprobate and they are rejected of the Lord. I do believe that. I believe that doctrine. However, we can't always know when someone gets to that point. And you could have someone as wicked as Manasseh who, who is responsible for innocent blood being shed, going to witches, doing, all, you know, doing just about everything against the law. I mean, you name it, it's like he was doing it against breaking God's laws. But he was still able to be saved. I believe this. Look, let's read in, in 2 Chronicles 33. Look at verse number 10. Verse number 10, the Bible says, And the Lord spake to Manasseh and to his people, but they would not hearken. And this is the first thing I want to point out. You know, God was still trying to reach him. The Lord spake to Manasseh and to his people, but they would not hearken. They weren't listening to God. They didn't want anything to do with him. They're doing their own thing. Verse 11, Wherefore the Lord brought upon them the captains of the host of the king of Assyria, which took Manasseh among the thorns, and bound him with fetters, and carried him to Babylon. So we already see a precursor to what's ultimately going to happen in a short period of time is that Babylon came against them and took Manasseh. They, they captured him and they bound him and they brought him to Babylon. And it says in verse 12, And when he was in affliction, he besought the Lord his God and humbled himself greatly before the God of his father. See, Hezekiah had started to get lifted up with pride and Manasseh continued that and brought that to a whole nother level. It's easy when, uh, see, Manasseh wasn't around for the tough part. He was only 12 years old when he began to reign. He wasn't there when Sennacherib came, the king of Assyria, and, you know, from the king of Assyria to, to battle against them, and they were completely outnumbered, and God wrought the victory. He just grew up in a time that was reaping of the fruit of his father's labor and didn't have his own battles and his own struggles to deal with, and he got even more lifted up in his position and his stature and everything else and just turn to, to all the other elements of the world. But when his affliction came, because God brought affliction on him, he, got, he, he, he was taken captive. It wasn't a fun experience at all. He's being bound up, carried to Babylon. And when he was in his affliction, he besought the Lord as God and humbled himself greatly before the God of his fathers. And you know what? That's what every single person has to do in order to get saved. Because in order to accept a free gift of salvation, you have to humble yourself. You have to be willing to admit, one, I'm wrong. That in itself is, is humility. It's humbling to say, I've done wrong. I'm not as good as I think I, I am. Actually, I deserve a punishment of hell. And no matter what I do, I can't be good enough to achieve it. So I need help. I need a savior. And it's that humility. I mean, I don't care who you are, whoever is saved, you need that humility to get saved. You, you have to understand that you are a sinner that deserves a punishment and you can't save yourself. And all these people we talk to that, that claim their works and, oh, you got to do this and you got to do that, they are not humble. They're lifted up in pride because they think that they're going to earn their way into heaven when the Bible says all of our righteousnesses are like filthy rags in the sight of God. That, that's, that's how he views them. We can't do it. But Manasseh, it says he humbled himself greatly. Now, he sinned greatly. He was turned away from the Lord greatly. He had no respect for God and did everything contrary to the Lord, but he humbled himself greatly. 
And it, and it took for him to get in his time of trouble. And you know what? For some people, it does take that. Some people are lifted up in their pride. They have great businesses. They have great successes. They've earned all this wealth. They're doing great. And it takes for them, for God to just bring them down and lose everything before they finally get it and get saved. And you know what? Praise God for that. And there's people that I pray that God will bring low and humble them because I want them to be saved and go to heaven. And you know what? That's not a bad prayer. You don't always want to tell the people that if you're praying specifically for someone that you're praying that, that God takes away their business and brings them down real low. Brings, you know. But it, it's true. And I, do, and I do. There are certain people, I'm not going to name names, there are certain people I pray that for them because I feel like that might be the only way that they, that, that they can be humble enough to receive a free gift and to not rely on themselves. It, it needed to be that way for Manasseh. And his father apparently didn't do a good job, but see, there's still hope. You may come from a family where your parents didn't do a good job of, of raising you. They didn't do a good job of explaining things to you, of telling you the truth, of explaining who the Lord is, even if they were saved, even if they were right. But there's hope, and there's hope for everybody. Manasseh was brought low. Let's keep reading. We're going to read a little bit more about, um, because this is the good side of it. And this is near the end of his life. This is, this is later on. But thank God he did get right. Verse number 13. And prayed unto him, and he was entreated of him, and heard his supplication, and brought him again to Jerusalem into his kingdom. Then Manasseh knew that the Lord, he was God. He knew it. He believed it. He trusted God. Verse 14. Now after this, he built a wall without the city of David on the west side of Gihon in the valley, even to the entering in at the fish gate and compass about Ophel and raised it up a very great height and put captains of war in all the fenced cities of Judah. And he took away, look at this, he took away the strange gods and the idol of the house of the Lord and all the altars that he had built in the mount of the base of the, uh, of, excuse me, in the mount of the house of the Lord and in Jerusalem and cast them out of the city. So he's, he's trying to make amends now. He's going back and saying, you know what? We're going to have some trouble coming. So he's trying to get this. He's trying to help the city now be protected. He's building up the walls, setting up a watch, getting, getting rid of the false gods, taking down the idols, and just doing everything now to try to get right. He has completely repented from his false religion. He has completely changed his mind. He's no longer worshiping Baal. He knows God is a true God. Now he's getting rid of all his junk and trying not to, to anger the Lord any more than he already has been. Uh, verse number 16, and he repaired the altar of the Lord and sacrificed there on peace offerings and thank offerings and commanded Judah to serve the Lord God of Israel. So he's turned about 100% from seducing them to do so much evil. Now he's commanding them, no, you know what? We're going to serve the Lord. This is what we're going to do. Verse 17, nevertheless, the people did sacrifice still in the high places and see, the high places just end up sticking around again anyways. It's, so, it's just so hard to get rid of some things. Yet unto the Lord their God only. So they, they still use, they use them to serve the Lord. They, they, were, they were genuine in their service to the Lord, but God's still not happy that those high places are there. Verse number 18, Now the rest of the Acts of Manasseh and his prayer unto God unto his God, and the words of the seers that spake to him in the name of the Lord God of Israel, behold, they are written in the book of the kings of Israel. See, he was hearing from God. Now, at first, he didn't want to hear it. But after he finally got humbled, then he did. He did end up hearing it and receiving it. Verse number 19, his prayer also and how God was entreated of him and all his sin and his trespass and the places wherein he built high places and set up groves and graven images before he was humbled, behold, they are written among the sayings of the seers. What an what a, what a interesting, a great story. Now, obviously, we don't like how wicked Manasseh was, but we could learn a lot from it. We really do see how God can have mercy on a person's soul. But don't mistake that God still brought judgment as a consequence and a result of what he did. He doesn't let that sin just go unpunished. Now, the salvation of his soul, that sin didn't go unpunished either. Our Lord Jesus Christ paid for that sin when he died on the cross and he rose again from the dead. He paid the sin for that. He paid the price for that. But all the wickedness that was done in this lifetime, see, the Bible says that, you know, whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. 
And the things that we do, you sow to the wind, you're going to reap the whirlwind. And Manasseh sowed to the, Manasseh sowed to the whirlwind. He's going to, you know, and they ended up reaping tenfold the, the whirlwind. It was, you know, it's a big deal. And we, we need to keep that in mind, too, that even, even being saved, you know, you can do things as life and they're going to have an impact on other people and you could be bringing back really bad consequences. We need to invest in, our, in the future. We need to invest in our children. We need to invest in other people and help, our, you know, try not to get lifted up in pride. You've been saved. You can be saved for 50 years and still get lifted up with pride and have negative consequences come back against you even if you've done so many other great things for the Lord. Let every man that standeth take heed lest he fall. Amen. We have to take heed to ourselves regularly. Keep yourself humble so that God doesn't have to bring you low. But thank God for his goodness and even someone like, and, and keep that in mind, even someone like Manasseh is able to get saved. Amen. It may take a while, you know, we don't want to just give up on people and just, just know that, that God's powerful, God's word is powerful, and, you know, someone being humbled is, is all it takes. And it may not be the time that we deal with someone specifically, individually, in that moment, but don't, don't completely forsake them unless you've got a good reason to think, you know, they're like some, uh, some child molester or something some total reprobate that again you look at Romans chapter 1 and you'll see what I'm talking about there but God's able to save people to the uttermost and we need to remember that preach the gospel stay humble let's bow our have a word of prayer dear heavenly father lord we thank you so much for uh, these great stories in your word and just the the great truths lord we thank you um, for keeping them around for us today in 2017 and for caring about us um, as much as anyone else, dear Lord. And we ask that you would please help us to be a, a beacon of truth for, for this dark world. Help us to reach people and to, to preach the truth unto them and to preach your, your long-suffering mercy and goodness in, 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 in the form of salvation, Lord. But help us also to stand firm and let people know and be warned that you are also a God of judgment and that we do need to have a, a reverence and a fear of the Lord and that, and that people need to be warned about this because the judgment is coming. And I know that, that you, know, you don't change. And the way that you were back then is the way that you are now and you feel about the, the same about the innocent blood being shed and the people becoming godless and turning to their own lusts and... and Basic, basically the satanic worship of, of their own idols um, is, is going to come back to bite this country, dear Lord. And I pray that you please just help us to be the salt of the earth and uh, to tr try to preserve any goodness that there is. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.